what's the difference between methane and carbon dioxide from like a climate perspective? And I thought we can just convert everything to carbon dioxide equivalent and just like view it that way. Like what, what's the difference? Don't poke the bear late at night. No, that's what I'm trying to do. (laughs) (laughs) I know. Welcome to Climate Papa. This is a show about climate change, technology, and parenthood. Welcome to Climate Papa, a show about the intersection of climate change, technology, and parenthood. And I'm Ben Eilson. I'm based in Seattle, and I invest in product-led climate companies. And I'm a papa to two kids, a five-year-old girl and a two-year-old boy. I thought the following conversation could use some framing. When a lot of people first look to work on or make an impact in climate, they try to find some ways to simplify the problems in front of them. They often hunt for the sort of silver bullet that could make the biggest dent. Or they look for the sort of low-hanging fruit, the work that is most immediately in reach. I find that Erica is very different. She is one of the biggest picture thinkers I've encountered. And in reflecting on my conversation with her, I think she's really uninterested in what might be easy or popular to work on. She returns again and again to what instead really deeply matters. How do we reduce the chances of our worst-case climate outcomes? And what paths in that are shockingly or almost embarrassingly underdeveloped and underdiscussed, even in climate circles? Even the simple things like the units we use for understanding emissions, usually carbon dioxide equivalents, does a terrible job of helping us understand the crucial factors that are really going to affect our lives in the coming decades, like much more potent but short lived greenhouse gases like methane. We cover her transition from leadership roles in software companies to exploring the frontier of climate solutions. And I try to understand what it is about her and her partner, Peter, that motivate them to really see these spaces years before most other people do. I ended extremely grateful that Erica is out there doing this work with Spark Climate, because I have a unfortunate feeling that we're going to need the plan B, C, and D that she's now working on. And of course, we spent a lot of time talking about our kiddos and trading stories. Here's Erica. Yeah, great to be here. Um, My name is Erica Reinhardt. I'm based in San Francisco, and I also have two kids. They're also five and two and a half, as she would correct you. Super important. Uh, Five-year-old boy and a two and a half-year-old girl. How was your bedtime? I handled both kids because my husband is on a climate trip right now. And uh, they were highly energetic, which involved the entire bathroom getting soaked by slashes from the bathtub, which they were both tickled pink about, had a grand old time. And now they're both quiet for the time being. What are some of the things your kids are up to these days? Uh, Playing in the garage a lot. Hmm. We've always got cardboard. Building things? Okay. Yeah. A lot of two by fours. Two by fours. Constantly get new screws and nails put in them and taken back out of them and stickers all over the place. Amazing. Constant and like stickers. What it, what is your power tool policy with them? The power tools are in. The power um, tools are in, okay. With with appropriate supervision, but it is incredible what a five year old can safely do with a power tool. Mostly the drill. Saws definitely require parental attention. But yeah, with a drill he's pretty good and he'll build huge contraptions of he calls them boats and planes and all sorts of things with two by fours and a few screws. Pretty amazing. Uh, amazing you can create. And and you let the five year old supervise the two year old in the Primarily. garage. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's what we do too at this point. It's a big difference I've noticed between the, the second and the first. The first is like two adults on one, and then the second is like, no, oh, the five year old's in charge, you know? We'll hear if something goes way off. So we're both from Santa Barbara, although I don't think we crossed paths back then, right? Not that I know of. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we went to different high schools. <laughs> been at the beach at the same time. Yeah. Despite being from Santa Barbara, I did not spend enough time at the beach. I didn't appreciate Me it. Me neither. Me I either. was like in the physics lab. But we, we met at Stripe, I think, and probably in 2018. Yeah, that sounds right. And somehow, like many Stripes found their way into the climate world. Was there something about having kids that changed your perspective on how you wanted to be more involved or how did those things intersect for you? After having kids, I found myself thinking a lot more about how I was spending my time and why. 
as cheesy as and as it sounds, how to leave the world a better place with the time that we have uh, and how to be intentional about what we do with the time that we're not with our kids. The costs start to feel a lot higher um, yeah. and we start to feel like more invested in the health of the future. And so I dove into climate when my son was about a year and a half old. Um, that's probably not an entire coincidence. Could you give a little version of kind of your like career path up until 2019 that feeds into how you think about the different ways you could deploy yourself into the problem? My background is primarily in engineering and engineering management. So I went to MIT, studied mechanical engineering, computer science, and electrical engineering, was interested uh, in things at the intersection as well as things that did have a mission attached. I can't actually tell you why that was important to me, but starting in junior high or high school, that was something that that really was important to me at every step of the way. Um, and so that led me to the Bay Area when I graduated. First, a small startup called Planet Labs, which was launching satellites to do constant Earth observation. Then I left and did a bunch of election work in 2016 when Trump was up for election, and that also had an underlying climate motivation. I uh, took a bit of a detour into AI and then Stripe, really um, motivated by learning different things and seeing different environments after being in early stage startups. And so when I dove into climate, I think, you know, the way I've always thought of myself and I still do is as a technically minded uh, generalist problem solver and leader. Mm -hmm. Pretty early on in my career, I switched to primarily managing big engineering groups. And what was always fun for me about that was being able to think about what are the problems we're really solving and working across a variety of different types of teams. So that is the ethos that I brought into my climate uh, journey, combined with the other piece that I've always really enjoyed is being at the early entrepreneurial stage of things and figuring out how to get my hands dirty in undefined spaces and undefined problems to figure out how to build from the ground up, um, yeah. which is also what I was interested in, in climate. Okay. So post Stripe, decided to, to jump more fully into climate. What did that look like for you? I remember you releasing a really interesting personal carbon analysis, I think back in 2020. How did you find your way into ultimately the problem space that you're focused on now? It was a very winding road. So in 2019, when I, I gave myself this year-long sabbatical to learn and figure out where I most wanted to sort of land long-term, um, I knew that there was a lot that I didn't know. And so I started literally just reading IPCC chapters and allowing myself to fall down the interesting rabbit holes yeah. and just sort of see where my curiosity took me. Uh, at the time, I assumed that on the other end, I would start a climate tech company, um, given my background and what I was familiar with at the time. Then COVID hit, and yeah. I got pulled into a bunch of COVID response work, which led to a bunch of election work, which was all really impactful and really fun and rewarding. Um, but it wasn't squarely climate. And so I really came back to climate in early 2021 after basically a nine-month uh, detour. My updated frame at that time was being really interested in these areas within climate that weren't getting nearly enough attention from what I had learned. And so I was already kind of really interested in nerd pilled uh, by methane. Um, really interested in this question of where there's white space. Yeah. So my husband has a carbon dioxide removal company and I've had a front row seat to what's happening in that ecosystem for the last few years. And the massive disconnect between how much that space gets talked about and what we actually saw happening in the space was jarring. Yeah. I was kind of on this journey like, what are those other things like that. Yeah. But just to pause one second, but for those listening that kind of aren't watching it, a lot of companies and a lot of the models we have say that we need to be removing large amounts of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And that's great in a plan, but like generally speaking, we don't have a way to do that at scale. One of the approaches that I believe Peter is working on at, at Charm Industrial is one of the kind of leading approaches to do that. But there's still so much of a gap we have to be at the scale of, what is it, 10 gigatons of carbon dioxide a year right. removed. And I, I don't know the percent 
d- division, but it's uh, we have many zeros before we get to the one. Uh, in point We're zero. at about 10,000 tons done to date. 10,000. Uh, we need to get to about 10 billion per year uh, over the next few decades. And uh, you can count on one hand the number of companies that have so far contributed to those 10,000 permanent CDR tons. And, uh, and the idea being that there's going to be emissions that we might need to live with ongoing, whether that's certain forms of travel or transportation or manufacturing, the things that we can't fully electrify, and to reverse where we've gotten to. Okay. So I guess if you were, I don't know how many years you zoom back, maybe it's four years or not even, where that space was assumed to be part of the plan, but so underinvested in. And it sounds like a similar model, like you were in a sense seeing like, okay, are there other gaps, not exactly like that, but systemic gaps in, in our plan? That's right. Yeah. I was really intrigued by this question of what is the stuff that we either are learning that we need to do or that we may come to learn that we need to do where we are as far behind in actual action as we are in fields like carbon dioxide removal. And then lots of random things happened and clicked into place. Yeah. One of them was figuring out how to deploy a personal philanthropy budget and um, using that to really learn a lot about the nonprofit side of things, which I didn't previously have exposure to. All that kind of organically led to deciding to jump in to help start this nonprofit that now has been around for a year and a half and has been sucking up all of my non-kid time now, making it happen, which has been awesome. One of the pieces that clicked for me was seeing that we needed entrepreneurial type people on the nonprofit side as much or more than we need on the for-profit side, largely because so many of those people already are going to the for-profit side. Super interesting. And it it sounds like you kind of went to, okay, what is the work that needs to happen? And then work backwards from what should the model around that work be? My co-founders and I were all really interested in this question of what are the types of solutions that we are likely or possibly going to need in the future that are woefully behind? And how do we help get them going to uh, provide, to to add to our overall solution portfolio and sort of de-risk some of the options that we'll have in the future as hopefully ambition continues to increase? We have a lot of solutions on the table and we have a lot of effort around um, getting those deployed. We need more of both of those, and those are incredibly important. And also, unfortunately, it's not enough. Yep. Um, And so we've been really interested in that. Uh, Even if we do all those things, it's not enough question, and how do we accelerate that? You're inherently talking about things that don't yet exist and don't yet have incentive structures. Otherwise, they wouldn't be in that bucket. Got it. And so for that problem space, we thought that, really focusing on the nonprofit side of things was really crucial because otherwise you would be uh, following the all the existing incentives, um, which would, uh, by definition, rule those areas out mm. more broadly. I think the main question is always just, what is the problem you're trying to solve? Why isn't that problem already solved? And how can you structure things to enable you to solve that problem in a new way that allows you to solve it? Got it. Um, and sometimes... That will mean that you need to be for profit. Sometimes that means you need to be nonprofit. I think the interesting opportunity looking at the nonprofit side, given that I think it is less frequently looked at seriously, is that there is a set of problems that can be uniquely solved with fully catalytic capital that otherwise are not incentivized, that where it can be particularly high leverage as long as you're up for figuring out how to get it done. Yeah. And it definitely comes with its own challenges. It sounds like there's a set of things that we're going to do or doing because the markets are there for them, right? We're going to invest, even if it takes 30 years, in nuclear energy generation because we know if you build it, people will pay for the energy. And now we're at a point where the carbon removal market is finally being stood up. And so we know that people will pay for high quality carbon removal because we have the frontier fund and these sorts of market incentives. But it sounds like you're saying there's a set of things that we just don't have a market around or even kind of line of sight to a market. So no one's going to take the risk in exploring it. I guess, help me understand 
where you think about like university research versus the types of things that need a nonprofit kind of research engine. So I'll say on the nuclear and CDR examples that if I think for every sector in climate, what you see under the hood is actually this really tight blending of things mm-hmm. happening on the nonprofit and the for-profit side. Using carbon dioxide removal, CDR as an example, there's incredibly important policy work that needed to start before any of the companies did in order to help establish those incentives and also just increase education and awareness of the issues. Got it. And now that there are for-profit companies, they are able to draw a lot of investment capital. And yet, there also aren't yet full markets created to purchase carbon dioxide removal at scale because it's inherently a public good. The companies in the space now do have you know, incentive to help solve those problems. And so they're playing a part, um, but it's a very complex system that requires a lot of players. And there's continues to be really crucial um, work happening on the nonprofit side in addition to the for-profit side. I think in climate in particular, I think this is different than many of the industries we've come from, that you really do have this tight coupling between what's happening. I think, if, again, if you look at most other climate sectors, we will hopefully see great acceleration from the Inflation Reduction Act, just as one example. That was all policy work, and that was enabled by political engagement. And so I think, again, these are all very intertwined, particularly when we're talking about most climate solutions having some correcting for some type of market failure um, and sort of needing support in working through that. It does strike me like when you're going through a transition this big, and all the things we need to do, some of those are known, some of those are these unknown things, which are the things you're focused on. Like, you're absolutely right. The market maybe doesn't exist yet, or the technology doesn't exist yet, or people aren't educated on these things yet. Like, it all kind of has to happen together at once as quickly as possible. I think about most of the things, at least I've worked on, and normally you're kind of like innovating on one dimension in some set of stable constraints. You're building software for you know the latest phone but you can compartmentalize a lot of externalities even in fintech like even in stripe like the banking stuff worked kind of the way it's going to work and we get to build on top of it but a lot of what we're talking about here we need to simultaneously transition the policy the financing the technology for deployment the labor that's going to do the work the education both consumer and cultural and some cases political new markets or new incentive structures for society i guess ultimately that like are very multifaceted. So that's that's really interesting. For- totally. In addition to being a high impact area for people who like to think about systems and how disciplines fit together, it's also just a massive intellectually fascinating exercise to figure out how we can collectively most move the needle because I, as you said, you, you can't work in silos and it is inherently <laughs> more complicated when you're solving for market failures as opposed to uh, building single products with single customers within either existing markets or slightly new created markets thanks to a single product. Climate's way more fun and challenging than that. Yes, yes, it is. Okay, we zoomed way out. I don't know to how many feet, but maybe 100,000 feet. I want to zoom way in. What have you found are those at least initial set of things in that bucket that you've decided you want to try and move the needle on? Yeah, so we're currently focused on really high potential and very emerging climate solution areas where we need more solutions and we are uh, woefully off track from being able to ensure that they exist sort of given the status quo. And that has led us to methane as a greenhouse gas as a first focus area. Not the only one, but where there's very clear, urgent needs that because widespread attention to the area is so relatively new, there are still lots of gaps. And so within that, we've been focused on two different areas. One is enteric methane mitigation. So this is colloquially cow burps. (laughs) Yeah. Um, The challenge here is that about a third of our anthropogenic, so human directly human-caused methane emissions come from cows burping. And we 
by and large, don't actually have the solutions necessary for that problem. Mm -hmm. In many ways, it's somewhat reminiscent of carbon dioxide removal and that there are some solutions that get a lot of media attention. And so I think there's a widespread impression that we are in better shape than we actually are, given that the solutions that are talked about apply to a very small percentage of global cows. And, and, and so Enteric has fortunately started to get more attention in the last few years, um, but it's still a very early field that will need a lot of additional support to be able to maximally contribute to emissions mitigation. The second field we've been focused on, where we've been most focused in the last year, given just how totally neglected it has been, is called atmospheric methane removal. Mm. And so this is trying to answer the question of, is there a way, once methane is already in the atmosphere, that we can get it out even faster than it naturally would? And the reason that that's important is that, one, we have a lot of methane in the atmosphere, and unfortunately that curve is only accelerating. And so about half a degree Celsius of warming today is caused by methane emissions. And two, um, there are increasing risks of natural systems elevating their, their methane emissions in ways that we can't control. So in addition to be cutting all of the directly human-driven methane, uh, we have this sort of this additional category of emissions that barely gets talked about. This is like permafrost m melting and releasing methane. Yeah. The two big ones are permafrost and wetlands. Okay. Um, and so the potential of atmospheric methane removal is that it could give us an additional tool in our toolbox to help to uh, bring down temperatures given that half a degree and warming due to methane and also potentially be something that we could scale up further if necessary mm -hmm as we saw these natural emissions on the rise and have some sort of response to mute at least part of that impact. It's a very early field. Really don't know yet whether, like whether these it's approaches will work. Yeah. Um, but there are some promising angles that weren't really getting any support. Um, to your question before about yeah. universities, a lot of what we do is uh, help to support university research. And sometimes uh -huh. that's directly by working with the researchers to design and structure a research program and then fund it ourselves out of the nonprofit. And then also increasingly working with government to help increase federal funding for universities to access. Very few systems are self-correcting. Money doesn't just show up for yep. new climate areas on its own. It takes a wrangler often to, to get that going and show those early results and make sure that folks are educated on the potential. So it sounds like part of what you're doing on that is is really trying to beat the drum and say, hey, we need to invest in understanding what we can do here. We're willing to be part of that investment, but we need governments and universities to pair with us to, to amplify that. We're going to help frame the problem, right? Because people, and I think this is one area I'm pretty curious to go deep on, which is kind of framing the problem. I think most people know that methane is a greenhouse gas. I think most people know that methane is a big part of natural gas that they might be using in their you know, stove at home or to heat their home in a gas furnace. What's the difference between methane and carbon dioxide from like a climate perspective? And I thought we can just convert everything to carbon dioxide equivalent and just like view it that way. Like what, what's the difference? Don't poke the bear late at I, night. No, that, that's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, so methane is a very potent greenhouse gas, more so than carbon dioxide on a molecule to molecule basis. Um, and it's also short lived. So it's very, it's a very different dynamic than carbon dioxide does, uh, where carbon dioxide is very long lived. Once you emit it into the atmosphere, it'll be there for centuries before it very slowly gets incorporated by natural systems or potentially in the future gets sucked back up by some at-scale carbon dioxide removal method, though very little of that is happening yet today and folks are working really hard on increasing that volume. So methane comes from a number of sectors. Um, you can basically break it down very roughly to a third from our energy system and fossil fuels, a third from agriculture, and a third from waste, so landfills and wastewater. 
So it's a pretty different set of mm -hmm. sources than CO2, where CO2 is you know, predominantly from the energy sector. But when we think about methane, um, waste and agriculture are really high up there yep. on the list. Now, the unique role that methane mitigation can and needs to, <laughs> at this point, given where we're at, play in mitigating climate impacts is that because it has this short-lived nature, as we reduce our methane emissions, we will actually see over a few decades uh, that our atmospheric methane levels would go down and the warming contribution from methane would go down. And that's different than CO2. CO2, you've, you may have heard the bath analogy. Yeah. Um, you keep putting the bath water in, it keeps going up, 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 up. And it's only when we turn on that drain of carbon dioxide removal that it starts going down. Um, methane is the, the bubble bath on top. Mm. So it's floating on top of that. Um, we care about the total level of the bath plus the bath bubbles. And those bath bubbles do eventually pop. But it takes a while. And right now we are pumping more bubble bath in faster than it's popping. And so that foam on top is growing and growing. And as I mentioned before, it's about half a degree of warming right now out of the total of 1.1 warming that we're seeing. There's a bunch of complications around that. And so when you look at what climate models say we would need to do in order to be able to stay uh, below either 1.5 or 2 degrees C, because of these different dynamics, what kind of pops out is we're depending on us aggressively cutting methane emissions in order to get that benefit of the methane portion of warming coming down because our CO2 portion of warming is going to keep going up during that transition. Which and so our methane emissions have a really big impact on our peak temperature, aka our overshoot over 1.5 or whatever target you want to set at this point. And methane mitigations can play a really big role in shaping the warming that we see over the next few decades to keep that as low and slow as possible and contribute to it eventually going back down. Got it. Okay. First of all, thanks for going through that. So I think this overshoot concept is actually worth drilling in on because when we say, okay, we get all the countries together, we come up with a political plan, we're going to hit one and a half degrees C, but there's a lot of different ways to get there. A lot of models, I believe, have us overshooting by different amounts. And first of all, these units don't really have any intuitive sense, but like crossing that line and how much you cross that line determines how much famine, how much climate migration how much of the earth becomes uninhabitable during that period of time. That overshoot is not a harmless like line across the curve, right? It actually is what peak temperature do we get to? And that has all these follow-on effects. Some of those which could also then lead to these spiraling of more problems that we have to then unwind with more methane being released from permafrost and all these things. Is that why we should be really concerned about overshoot and kind of the shape of that? Yeah. So when we talk about temperature targets, we're really talking, just in terms of how the models work, we're talking about temperatures in 2100. Okay. Um, and we're not talking a lot about the shape of the curve from here to there, which nor is, after that. Which is um, insane because that's our, I mean, insane. well, yeah. because like between now and 2100, that's that's the whole thing that everyone alive that's going to experience. So if we're going to try and motivate, yes, I care where we end up in 2100, but I also really care about 2050 and 2060 and 2080, if you like, or 2030 for that matter. Like that feels pretty uh, tangible. We need to care about it all. Yes. And, you know, near-term temperatures have near-term impacts and also long-term impacts. And so right now we are approximately, based on some modeling, on something like a 2.5 plus or minus degree trajectory. And that's what talking about 2100 temperatures. And in those models, it is still, uh, we're still on an upward slope. Um, which is really bad, right? It's just, it's getting worse and worse. And so our job uh, collectively is to do everything we possibly can do and then some in order to bring temperatures down and stop that upward march. But as you mentioned, if we're only talking about uh, interception at 2100, that leaves, that leaves a lot of questions. 
And so 1.5 degree consistent scenarios mean they result in us being at 1.5 in 2100, which is a really important goal. Way better to have that than two degrees or three degrees. But we're really behind. It is really hard, potentially to the point of no longer being plausible to do so without at least temporarily exceeding 1.5. And that's sort of this idea of overshoot Mm -hmm. is that we um, could follow a trajectory, which would still take gobs of work, um, that would have us go above 1.5 degrees for some period of time to some amount and then come back down to be back by 2100 and, to we're, and we're coming down largely because we're getting better and better at carbon dioxide removal so we're opening the drain of the bathtub recovering from overshoot is depending on there being massive scales of carbon dioxide removal got it as you said to open that drain the models have us needing to cut methane emissions even prior to that just to in order to help keep that peak temperature down got it um, if you don't do that, then all of these numbers are higher at every point in time. But methane emission cuts do also play this important role in dropping temperatures relative to what they would be with constant or growing okay. methane emissions. And how, how long does methane stay in the atmosphere? It's a half of about a decade. So it does make a tremendous difference to the extent we can mitigate and stop emitting methane. It sounds like one of the problems is maybe the energy sector, we can have a clear plan, but then agriculture and waste feel a lot less tenable when we think about what goes into that, right? That's like either massive behavior change and or massive system changes in terms of like how we think about food waste. That's right. There are efforts underway to mitigate all of the emissions that we know how to. However, there are many emissions that we don't yet know how to get rid of. So there's a huge policy focus in oil and gas, and a large portion of that is because a high portion of those emissions we know what to do about. We have mm. the technology. That's not true for cows, for example. Yep. There are some solutions that are starting to roll out and need to continue to but those are going to address very small percentage. So this is uh, things of- like if we feed cows certain feed additives that's going to reduce it but then that doesn't deal with the cows that are grazing right like those sorts of distinctions or are there others that are worth knowing about that's a really really big one okay um there are other practice changes that can be put in place that are not only feed additives but a huge portion of the cow challenge is that we have huge numbers of cows that are out grazing where feed additives are not applicable and where the cows are deeply culturally intertwined um, to where they are. Uh, And so the decisions we made here are not always as simple as, do I want a hamburger and how's that hamburger made? Mm -hmm. Um, And even those alt proteins, as they're called, are in the relatively early days of development um, and not that widely manufactured and accepted so I'm trying to do cow pie scale math in my head. Do we have, is it something like a billion cows, like 30 billion chickens or something like that? Is that something like that? Okay. And so of the billion, how do I think about how many are kind of like on a farm eating feed versus roaming? From the best estimates that are out there, it is something like five to 10% of cows are in what are called intensive environments that are on feed and then the other 90 plus percent are what are what's called extensive systems um, where those that's not the case so it's like pretty unintuitive i think for many people who don't spend any time around cows they assume that they're around a barn and being fed something so if we have a feed additive like problem kind of solved great problem like somewhat improved for maybe maximum 10 percent of cows the other 90 percent we have to figure out what to do okay so what can we do or what research should we do about what we can do We don't have the answers yet, um, but there is more science now going into understanding the microbiome of cows and what these different intervention points could be. There are solution development efforts underway um, around uh, practices that could apply to a cow that you're not 
feeding, vaccines are being talked about, something called a bolus is being talked about, which is the thing that hangs out in a cow's stomach. So mm-hmm. it could you know, be there for a month. You only got to put it in the cow once a month. Okay. There's also breeding efforts that are uh. ongoing. Um, and those have those have demonstrated success. It's not going to get us 100% of the way there, but we might see uh, some sort of durable decreases in methane emissions that we could then apply some of these other methods on top of. Interesting. This is not only a science problem, though. Yeah. There's huge uh, adoption challenges and uh, regulatory and market challenges that will also be faced as we think about how any of these things uh, might possibly be deployed globally. There's, as you said, a lot of cows globally, and we need to think not just about cows in barns that are the most accessible ones, but really be thinking about how do we build um, pathways to trust um, for the many smallholder farms that are distributed all around the world and where cattle and livestock uh, are a really important part of their family's security. So so to that point, there's so many pieces of the problem. What piece of it does Spark focus on in order to kind of push it forward? Yeah, so the, the angle that we're taking on all of the spaces that we're looking at is one of trying to do strategic road mapping to really understand what are all of the different pieces that need to come together in order to solve this problem. And then identifying, based off of that, where we think we can be most additive. One of the big things that jumped out to us last year when we started doing this road mapping was this problem of these huge gaps in solution development for cows. And for grazing cows, there was just really small amounts of funding actually going into supporting the scientists to find those solutions. We said, okay, that's the thing we're going to pick up even when we had very part-time staffing (laughs) and meeting a few hours a week late at night um, on it was helping to kick off uh, an effort and some recommendations around how we might better fund um, research in the space from the government to try to help to rise all boats in that space and unblock the folks who are eager to do this work but have just been incredibly cash strapped in finding support to actually be able to to do so. I guess it is infuriating to know that there are like researchers that want to work on methane mitigation that like fundamental pieces of methane mitigation and that they've been struggling to get funding for it over the last 20 years. That's like how we haven't set up pandemic preparedness Uh, and then we have COVID and then we still don't set it. I was just like, what are we, what are we doing? You know, so thank you for, thank you for, for jumping in and, um, and doing that. I'm curious if you look out ahead. So it's, I mean, it sounds like methane is kind of a deep, is actually a pretty deep surface area of these types of problems. Do you kind of think, okay, you take what you're doing with cows and you're like, okay, maybe there's similar pieces when we look at waste and similar pieces when we look at these other components of methane emissions. And that's kind of like the next roadmap for the other various categories that you might dive in on. Or do you think you're going to shift to these other potential white spaces that don't there aren't markets for yet? A bit of both. I think our current sweet spot are areas that have really large climate impact, particularly in the near term. A lot of concern about near-term risk, which has been pretty systematically under, under-focused on. Sectors that release methane are, are really big factors in that. But we're also looking at um, where are there other innovation areas that could play really important roles in both mitigation and adaptation that haven't gotten the the level of support they need yet to understand what the there there is. Yeah. And we're also interested in looking at where um where there's these risks in the system. Our main driver on working on atmospheric methane removal is that there's this risk in the system around natural methane releases, which um right. to date has mostly been talked about in terms of a motivation to keep overall temperatures as low as possible. But it's also like we should have a plan B. Incredibly, (laughs) exactly. It's incredibly important. And yet it's not looking like an assured policy uh, or assured success (laughs) 
by only having that one policy. And so we're interested in these other areas of what, you know, how can we prepare these plan Bs, which unfortunately, if you look historically, all the plan Bs that were talked about we've needed so far, right? Yep. Carbon dioxide removal. Yes. It was should have been the plan B. B. Yep. Caring about methane should have been the plan B. <laughs> um, we're blowing through all those and we're behind on all those. So those areas need support and we need to start thinking a little more proactively around, particularly now as there is more support, right? We think it's it's prudent to take a hard, realistic look at, at where we're at and and what we might need to expand this portfolio yeah. of solutions and responses as much as we can to de-risk our most likely pathway and also de-risk what are called these low probability, high impact events. Mm -hmm. um, that could knock the system sideways. The last thing I want to hit on, because I know we're getting very late, is there's a there's a comment you said to me that actually like really stuck with me. I don't even know if you remember this part of the conversation um, back, I don't know, maybe it was 18 months ago. It's all a blur. You said something about if you're going to go work in climate, like, get close to the to the frontier of the problem. That sounds like me. Yeah. And you're there. And I, I think there's something... Um, very curious for people about, well, both you and Peter, the fact that you're both have these very successful software careers. And then you're now, I, I could be wrong, but I think of you as like probably one of the experts in the world on what's underinvested in methane and like this whole issue, which is like physical, very biological. And, and Peter and what he's doing at Charm, like similarly. And just like help me understand what is underneath that and why you say that and why you, I guess, why you live that? Because I think it is actually like deeply inspirational, especially for people, I don't know, you know, coming from Stripe and Meta and Google are like, ah, I don't know what I can do in climate. And how did you blow through that imposter syndrome? Or maybe you never had it and just like help, help blast that to others. Oh man, I'll do my best. Um, I think there needs to be a lot of humility jumping into climate that there is a lot of work that's ongoing, which is um, incredibly wonderful. And we also know that it's not enough. And what that humility to me means, part of it is if you want to make a really massive dent, you have to go deep, right? If there were an obvious, easy fix, somebody probably would have done it. And yep. so... Your job as somebody new is to bring your fresh perspective and your energy to really do your best to understand whichever piece of the problem it is that you're excited about and uncover the layers, right? As we were talking about before, these systems are all very complex, depending on lots of different pieces fitting together. And I think it's by really coming with extreme curiosity and all of the good things that we learn in, in the tech sector, being detail-oriented, getting things right, building rigorously, are necessary here as long as you also have sort of the open-mindedness to be curious, to, to really understand the whole problem. For both of us, what that has meant is that these really early fields are particularly of interest to us, but the way that we got there was a lot of work, a lot of reading and talking to experts in order to learn <laughs> as much and as quickly as we can and then have that be an ongoing learning journey where and this is why I love what I do now. I'm, I'm constantly learning and I've also am buoyed by seeing that, that I have found these really important areas that aren't getting support where people are so thankful <laughs> to see more people coming. And I think yeah. it's going back to some of the comments earlier around kind of what's happening versus the appearance of what's happening. It's a common misconception that more is happening in some of these spaces than it is. And so I think coming with, without a lot of assumptions with as much humility as possible to understand where are things really um, and not taking a few media articles yes. uh, version of it, but like really digging into the details. It is unfortunately only relatively recently that climate has become a topic that some people are interested in. Yeah, A lot of great work is happening. 
almost everybody doing that work desperately needs more help, needs more friends. There's huge, huge winning impact to be had, but you have to you have to be curious and get your hands dirty and embrace that complexity to find some of the most interesting areas for sure. It's funny. I was just talking to someone last night who was like, I want to go work on climate. I'm ready to jump in. And I'm like, great. Like, it's, you got to go learn. Like, that's that's what you have to go spend the next however many months learn. Like, you have to go to the front lines and talk to the people working on the thing. Or you have to go read the papers that are, you know, out in the last five years and go read the IPCC report, not like the headline that comes out of it, because that's not going to give you that source of truth. That's the case in every part of every system here, whether that's where we're at in resi solar financing to where we are in methane removal. And I think it's probably more true in the areas you're on, but even the things that feel like, oh, they're there are still not as there as you would think that they are based on the sometimes polished like lens on it all. The key, I think, is for people to go in being like, oh, I'm ready to dig and to learn and find out that truth and then decide if I can do something there. And I think helping people get to that truth. And, and I'm excited by what you're doing. I hope we can at least move the unit conversation forward, um, which we should collaborate more on because I don't think people understand how much units matter. And I think they're deeply broken. I think everything in it does CO2 equivalent. And like ever since we talked, it drives me, like it just really deeply concerns me because we're talking about super different half-lifes and super different impacts. So um, maybe we can actually connect the metrics to kids to bring it full circle. I was talking to someone a few weeks ago who is now and has been for a decade, somebody who's done a lot of really important work on methane. Um, And it was interesting hearing what his aha moment was, which was he was working on some other non-methane focused work at the time. And um, using 100 year equivalents, it looked like what he was doing was helping and he felt really good about it. And then he discovered or he better understood these different gas dynamics and realized that under the hood from this thing that looked really good, that whatever it was he was doing at the time was actually having a near-term warming harm and contributing a little bit to long-term decreases in temperature because under that metric was a curvature that was being averaged. And he looked at that and he said, I didn't sign up for this. I didn't sign up to be doing work that's going to be making my and my kids' lives worse. Like, how how is it that I didn't know um, wow. and that inadvertently I am not addressing a part of the problem that I feel so strongly about addressing? And for this person, that was their aha moment on working on methane for a decade now and counting. I think the, there's a bunch of complex metrics and dynamics under the hood, but how all that in the end translates to the impact that we're having on both the near and the long term, I think it becomes a lot clearer just how important it is for us to take these issues seriously and to care about near-term warming and care about the drivers of near-term warming while also making sure that we're thinking about the world's potential great-grandchildren as as well as the world's children, but making sure that we're not accidentally not at least aware of uh, the impacts that we're having on both time scales. it's, It's one thing to be aware and make a decision and like own that. It's a different thing to not be aware because you were, we're not having the right, thoughtful, and like correct conversation. There's this chart that I'm sure you've seen, but I should kind of share in the show notes, which is from the latest IPCC summary um, around these different warming scenarios. It lays out these different scenarios and kind of age timeline. I think it was one of the, it was nice because it's one of the first times I saw them like actually putting kind of people born in different times and what their impacts are going to be. I want to make, and this is a call to action to maybe some like good front end, uh, product engineer to pair with on this. I want to make an interactive version of this where you put in your kids' ages and or or potential kids' ages and you play with different scenarios and you can hover on these different temperatures and what our projections are to really try and personalize the story. And we should do that with different gases, right? Because I think it's so hard to wrap your head around 2100 and what that is going to look like for me because 
the truth is when you talk about people's motivation right now, they're motivated because of the smoke in the summers or Texas freezing over. Like most people have deep motivation when it does or could really tangibly affect them in the near term. And that's exactly what you're talking about. And I think that we're missing a lot of the tools to communicate that. I think all most climate impacts are really hard to feel ahead of time. It, it's very quickly gets very abstract when we're talking about global surface average temperatures yes. and degrees of Celsius. Um, it doesn't tell us what people are experiencing, what which isn't a experience. global surface average temperature, right? It's extreme heat days, it's drought, it's extreme weather events, it's changes in food security. Yeah. Even those can be somewhat abstract concepts until they hit. But they're a lot more concrete, certainly, than two degrees C yes. global surface average temperature, yes. Yes. Um, which means almost nothing to just about everybody. <laughs> I think on that note, we should wrap. But if people want to get closer to the frontier that you're on, what is the best way for them to kind of follow along and learn? Easiest way to follow along is Twitter, both me personally and Spark Climate, the, the organization that I founded. Um, Spark does have a newsletter as well, and I'll work on sending more things out to it. Early resources that were helpful to me. If you want to go full on textbook mode, the some of the mitigation chapters of IPCC are very dense, but very comprehensive. One of my favorite resources, though, was the International Energy Agency Tracking Clean Energy Progress website. That's yes. the IEA TCEP, which tells you what kind of nerd I am. Since uh, I initially read it, there's been an innovation focused report that they've put out as well. So those those can be really helpful for kind of data-driven view. Our World in Data has a bunch of great blog posts on a bunch of varying topics. And if you want to really go down the methane hole, there's a great Climate and Clean Air Coalition Global Methane Assessment, 120-page report, all sorts of great graphs and information about available solutions, places that we don't have solutions, health impacts, uh, the whole gamut. That's a real Amazing. that's a real reference for the other Uber nerds out there. Okay. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for uh, staying on late for this. And um, we covered a lot of amazing ground. So I'm excited for people to be able to listen. All right, Erica said that she has more cute kids stories after we turned off recording. So I have a five year old and a and a two and a half year old. And they're obviously um exposed to climate related topics, yes. having the parents that they do. Uh, and what has been so heartening to me is two things. One, seeing their little problem-solving brains turn on. Yeah. Just the other day, we were having breakfast, and I told him, um, I'm so proud of all of your hard work in you know, finishing your preschool year. And he said, uh, I'm really proud of my hard work, too. And Daddy... I'm proud of you for taking the bad gases out of the air. And mommy, I'm proud of you for all of your business trip. <laughs> I had just come back from a business trip the week before. I'm not sure when you heard about the business trip. It wasn't quite as cute as the dad comment, but I'll, I'll take it. Yeah. And the problem solving point, uh, I think we really love raising very high agency problem solving children. Yeah, We don't care what they apply that to, but want them to know that they can uh, have an impact on whatever the thing is that they're excited about. And it's led to some um, incredible conversations, like four and five-year-old brains are awesome. There's a great Spotify podcast for kids brushing teeth. It's called Chompers, if you haven't discovered it oh, yet. Amazing, it's yeah. like two minutes twice a day, uh, and they've you know got some little cute toddler stand-up jokes while kids brush their teeth. And so for Earth Week, one night they mentioned palm oil and deforestation. And that really got the five-year-old brain chugging. And he was problem solving what we could do uh, to help save the forests from people cutting down palm oil. And he had some great ideas. He basically recreated Drone Seed, um, which is a company that uses drones to uh, accelerate reforestation. So he wanted to, you know, 
create a Amazing. plane that was going to drop all the seeds all the to seeds, yeah. build new forests. He also decided that he should put up a fence around the forests yeah. that the bad guys can't get in. Um, he invented a code that he told me for all the good guys to so go in and check on things. <laughs> and there was going to be some traps to to make sure that, that the bad guys didn't get in there for too long and cut down the trees. So I am optimistic uh, about um, raising a generation of children who know and feel like they can take action uh, on this challenge and the many others that we face. And hopefully by the time uh, they come fully into their own, this problem will be in better shape than it is now yeah. if we do um, as much work as we can, but that's not guaranteed. And in the meantime, I love the I love the cute comments. Yeah, thank you for sharing those. And I do think working on climate or something that just gives you like your own sense of mission, like kids, kids feel that really quickly, like, and they feel what you feel for how you're spending your time. And I've had moments like low points at work in the other direction where I've been like a little bit purposelessness and. My daughter and I, you know, I was like not working one day and my daughter's like, why aren't you going to work? And I was like, it wasn't making me feel good. And then the next day she's like, Papa, I don't want you to go to work. I don't want you to, to not feel good. On one hand, these comments are sometimes simple, but they're actually very profoundly correct. They want you to feel good about what you're doing and having purpose. And that rubs off on them as an energy and as a motivation. And uh, it's it is so awesome that your kids are so engaged with you, you both on on all the things you're doing and all the and all the bad gases you're taking out. So thank you. You're welcome. And uh, in the meantime, they're having a huge impact in keeping us focused and motivated. Uh, both because time is limited, uh, as it is for every parent, you gotta stay focused uh, and motivated because we have an extra personal feeling stake yes. uh, in the future and don't want to let them or anybody else down. Well, that's episode nine of Climate Papa. Please share this with anyone who you think might like it. One of the biggest things you can do to help this show is to please subscribe or follow and review the show in whatever podcast app you use. And please send me a note anytime to ben at climatepapa.com. I love hearing from listeners, hearing guest suggestions, or just little notes that you're out there. And with that, our music is the Balkan Bump remix of Mellow Kinda Hype by Slink and Lazy Sir Orchestra. Let's have them take us out. On we go like...